Friends, welcome to our service today. I've been away for the last few weeks on holidays, but it's really good to be back sort of with you. I know that I'm not quite there yet, or we're not quite there yet. We're still under this uh, pandemic, but hopefully soon we'll be here together. Uh, but in the meantime, I am so happy that you are joining us virtually, uh, whether you're a longtime St. Andrew's person or just stumbled upon our services online by chance. But however you've come to be with us, we welcome you. And please join with me in prayer. Holy God, this is a good day. We come together as a community of different ages, communities, home congregations, and reason to seek your place in our lives. We give you thanks that technology can help extend this welcome to many who would not otherwise be with us. We join together to seek wisdom, share comfort, offer compassion, and feel your love. We come to feel the abundance of your grace and know that you are indeed here for us. This is a reason to celebrate. This is reason to give thanks. This is reason to enter worship. We pray to you, who is our mother and our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our opening hymn today, we have Karen and Jenna again leading us in music. So please feel free to sing along at home if you wish, or just sit back and enjoy the lovely music. Uh, we're going to start off with Come Let Us Sing. Come let us sing to the Lord our song. We have so too nice a day to be stuck in my little dorm room studying. I had far too much homework to take the day off, but the great outdoors were calling. I don't know if you've ever been to Halifax, but it is a terrible place to have a university. Yeah, there's lots of universities and they're very, very good, world-renowned, but it's just too beautiful a city. There is too much to do to sit in a, in a dorm room or in a classroom and study for 16 hours a day. This was my last year of school in Halifax, and I really had to finish my work, but I came up with a compromise. There was a book I had to read that day, but rather than sit at my desk in my room or in the library, I took that book out to the park and sat there. There's public gardens in Halifax, which are just beautiful, filled with flowers, and there's ponds to sit next to. And so I found one of those ponds, and I sat on one of the park benches to sit and read my homework. There was three benches, and I sat off at, at the far one. But then there's a little while later, a couple, maybe some tourists visiting Halifax saw this beautiful setting and decided that they should take a break as well and sit by the pond and enjoy that moment. And so she sat down on a bench and then he went to sit next to her 
But she stopped him and said, no, no, don't sit here on this bench with me. Go and sit on that other bench. Otherwise, somebody else might sit there. Now, I should have gone and asked her for the sake of research why she would say such a thing because I wondered, why do you have to take up all of the benches? Maybe he had hygiene issues and this was her polite way of keeping him at a distance. Maybe they'd spent far too much time together traveling Nova Scotia. Maybe they had just spent a week in a tandem kayak paddling around and they really, really needed different seating. But what I think was actually happening there was they got caught up in this idea of scarcity. The idea that there's simply not enough. In this case, it's not an, there's not enough park benches, but it really applies to everything. There's not enough of anything. And so it's important, right and good, to claim as much as we can while we can whether we can sit together and enjoy that pond together or not. The idea of scarcity is really nothing new. I'm sure that a millennia ago, the cave people in the bear skins tried to kill all the mammoths they could so that the people wearing the lion skills skins didn't get to them first. Fast forward a few thousand years, many thousands of years, and we have a situation at a Palestinian lakeshore where there simply was not enough food. This is a story from Matthew chapter 14. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from, from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowd heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowd away so they may go into the villages to buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over from the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. I'm sure you've all heard this story. It's the most written miracle story in the Gospels. It's the only miracle that is told in all four accounts. And then, as a little bit of extra emphasis on how important this story is, Mark and Matthew tell this story with some variation twice. So from there, we can gather that this story is a big deal. Sure, the prodigal son story is great, but it only gets to one telling. The feeding of the multitudes, though, that enters almost nagging frequency. One reason this story is so important is that for Jesus and his followers and many in the early church, starvation was a constant threat. Malnutrition and, in, and disease infecting undernourished bodies was a reality that killed many. It's no wonder so much of the Bible has to do with food, sharing it, what can be eaten, hospitality, and promises of the day to come, like we hear from some of the prophets of a time when all people will be fed. Yes, we may see feeding as a metaphor for spiritual nurture or filling a hunger for justice, but if you haven't had a good meal in days or weeks, food is not some symbolic concept. It's a life and death situation. The disciples know this when they see the crowd which counts at 5,000 men. 
Of course, the women and the children weren't counted. But many of these people were going to be hungry. Many of these were here because Jesus had frequently talked about helping the poor and the sick and the hungry. Sure, they wanted to hear some words of wisdom from this great teacher, but some food would be really good as well. Understandably, the disciples are stressed. Everything's been going really well up until this point, but everyone knows no matter how well Jesus speaks, if people go home hungry, that's what they're going to remember. You think that people come away from St. Andrew's Church because of happy because of my sermons? Oh no, it's the UCW. It's the food they give everybody afterwards. That's, what, that's what's the key to a successful church. Send people home with some food. So the disciples don't know what to do, but Jesus tells the crowd to sit on the grass and he takes a few loaves and fish that he has and breaks them and passes them out. And as you know from hearing this story, everyone goes home happy and they even have some leftovers to serve at tea after synagogue on Saturday. So here we have a great miracle, the feeding of the multitude. But what may be more important though, is the teaching that, that applies today as it did 2,000 years ago. And that is to give up on the myth of scarcity. It's a myth that we are taught from day one and it's drummed into our heads every day of our lives. We're told that there's a limited time for this amazing sale, so come in and buy now. You have a scarcity of happiness, but if you buy our brand of beer, you can hang out with the cool kids at the beach and have fun. There's a terrible scarcity of youth and beauty, but if you buy our hair color, our clothes and our makeup, you too can look like a celebrity. While these lives are damaging enough on their own, there's another terrible side effect. When we buy into the myth of scarcity, we create scarcity that is all too real. Just like that couple that believed there was a shortage of park benches, their way of dealing with that challenge created a real scarcity of benches. We believe there's a shortage of wealth, so some hoard money in outrageous amounts, creating a scarcity for so many others. There, there's a perceived shortage of natural resources, so we go to other countries to collect gold and oil that is rightfully ours, but just inconveniently placed under their homes and forests and rivers. Not only creating a real scarcity, not, on, not only of resources, but of clean water and air and land, and ultimately, a scarcity of peace as we go to war over those resources. I think this story is included so many times because then as now, God provides everything we need, just not what our fear and greed would have us desire. We don't have to live with the myth of scarcity because when we do, we turn myth into reality. Imagine the scene by the lake's shore so long ago. Imagine the huge crowd gathered to hear Jesus, the one so many are talking about, the one who was rumored to be the Messiah, the one who, when he was near, conveyed the presence of God. Here are all these people gathered for a meal, but there is clearly not enough. You've come prepared though. You have enough for you and your family, but certainly not enough to share with others. Still though, as you listen to the words of Jesus, you feel that holy presence. You're inspired by the words and you decide that sure, let's share what little we have. You reach into your bag of meager supplies but notice that other people are sharing what they have as well. People are caught up in a frenzy of trust and generosity 
And in the end, out of almost nothing, everyone is fed. Now, some would criticize this explanation as a rationalization, that I'm trying to explain away the supernatural, God actively present in a crowd miracle, and say that the loaves and fishes didn't really magically divide. I don't think that the few fish fed thousands, but that's not to take away the miracle. In fact, I'd say something far more miraculous happened than ever would have occurred from just splitting fish and loaves. You see, we Christians, we're an odd bunch. We have this habit. We have talked for centuries about blind being healed, people rising from the dead, Jesus being born of a virgin, being the incarnation of God, and we believe all this stuff, no problem whatsoever. But humanity living with justice and having enough to eat for all? Now that's far-fetched. That's a miracle we could never hope for. Really though, it can happen. And on that day, a wonderful, fantastic, earth-changing, God-inspired miracle did happen. People gave up the myth of scarcity and shared generously and happily. A great God-inspired miracle happened that day, but unlike a magic fish, this is a miracle that can happen today or any day. It's the miracle that will happen when we all recognize the abundance of God's blessings and have such tremendous faith in that blessing. Such tremendous faith that Jesus was actually serious when he was talking, that we will all be willing to reach into our bag of meager supplies and share with the world. What greater miracle could we ever hope for? Please join me in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for the great abundance we find in our lives. Each day is filled with countless moments to feel your grace, share your love, and enjoy your blessings. We give thanks for the beauty of the summer, the taste of fresh produce, for a time of rest and holidays. Out of abundance, we offer prayers for those living in imaginary or far too real scarcity. We pray for those in our own community, even here in Moose Jaw. People live with a scarcity of food and opportunity. Too many in this time of pandemic have lost jobs, businesses, and opportunities. Too many have lost loved ones and friends. Too many have lost strength and health and wonder if this is now a reality of their lives. We pray for the end to all the wars and unrest around the world, so many built upon the myth of scarcity, the belief that there is only so much land, wealth, and power to go around, and so we must claim what we can while we can. We pray for those places where war and unrest continue to grow. We pray for those in Venezuela and the Middle East, We pray for peace and prosperity in places of conflict in Africa. We pray that the growing unrest in the U.S. turn to growing respect and the ability to think beyond ideological talking points and memes. We pray for the doctors, nurses, politicians, and scientists who are struggling to find a way forward in this strange time. We pray that solutions are found and that all of us can do what we can to keep ourselves safe, as well as the safety around us. 
we offer the silent and the spoken prayers of our hearts. Gracious God, we thank you for this community of faith and our place in your worldwide communion of humanity. We join our voices with the countless others who seek your wisdom, yearn to feel your presence, and walk in the way of Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Sent Forth by God's Blessing. God's grace is endless. God's blessing is bounteous. Go out into the world sharing the good news that there is no need to fear. There is enough for everyone. As long as we remember that when we gather at God's bounteous banquet table, that this is not just for us, but for us and our neighbors to share. Amen. <laughs>